intelligence or intelligent control of the body, right? What, what is behind all of this and what enables it? And before I can start sharing my thought, I would like to maybe uh, preface with that my background comes with more machine learning, robotics uh, kind of setting. And this is definitely a new area for me. I'm venturing into this area. So nothing I'm telling you today is kind of like decisions. It's more like my curiosity and however I've learned so far. So if you know more, definitely stop me, engage with me and, and like, you know, let's let's build this whole topic together. So going back to this question is what enables this complex decision-making and as a result, motor control. So if you ask neuroscience community or machine learning community, what enables complex decisions? For example, stop this. Here's an orangutan, and I don't know, like this is a pretty famous video. Uh, I'll speed it up. If you, if you haven't quite seen the video, the summary of the video is this an orangutan trying to build a hammock for itself from just like a rag of cloth that uh, it has found on the cage or something. And the complexity of the behavior is like incredible, right? You know, tying a knot, trying to adjust and see if you can fit. Uh, maybe it's too small. Let me open and readjust, right? Very complex decision making. And if you ask neuroscience people or machine learning people, hey, what's going on? Like, what, what like, how can we exhibit such complex uh, decisions and motor control? And they will say that, like, oh, neural decision making. You know, everything is neural. We do uh, amazing. There is some conflict about if the decisions are being synthesized in real time or being cached, but but it's mostly considered a neural decision making process. But here is another video I'll, I'll show you. And here we just removed the every neural decision making power from this cat. So it's a decerebrated cat placed on a treadmill. Okay, and the cat can still walk. As you adjust the speed of the treadmill, uh, it will still exhibit very complex gates, etc. So all of the previous theories come up, somehow comes in qu question over here. And this is where, if you ask a biomechanics person, they will say everything is in like biomechanics and spinal cord, and it's a distributed uh, decision making going on throughout the body, right? So it almost appears like that there are two facets of intelligence whenever it comes to like exhibiting complex motor control. One is cognitive decision-making that that, that is related to cognition and, and neural activity. But the second is also like musculoskeletal control. Like how can we uh, control the whole body and how this complex decision starts from the brain and slowly goes through the spinal cord, neurons, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to like basically po posit today that there are almost two facets of intelligent uh, cognitive decision-making and musculoskeletal control. And perhaps an intelligent being exhibits intelligent decision-making at the combination of both these fa facets, not in isolation. So towards this end, what we have done is first challenge is to build a system where you can look at the intersection of neural decision-making as well as biomechanics. And there is a well-known um, simulator out there it's called OpenSim and it has held the fort of the community for a really long time but there are two big challenges with that simulator that a it is not fast enough for data-driven techniques and b the contact dynamics is really missing so you can do postural control a lot but the context dynamics is very limited limiting so towards that end we have created this platform which we call Maya Suite. it is incredibly fast and with contact dynamics so I'm going to like explain to you and like show you guys a little bit features of the system and then we can we can go back to the original question we started with. Okay, so what is MyoSuite? It's a fast and physiologically realistic framework for musculoskeletal as well as exoskeletal studies. So we have both the system together you can study. And this is very interesting when you pair up humans with like exoskeletons or rehab devices and stuff. So this, this combination also can be very, very interesting. So what are the key properties of MyoSuite? It, the MySuite models are validated against the state of the art. So it is still the state of the art models that you are getting access to. There are improvements over the state of the art, but we haven't validated it. So let's just leave it at the state of the art for the moment. And it is over four orders of magnitude uh, more efficient than the OpenSim models that we are commonly familiar with. 
And this enables us to run modern machine learning algorithms in the same speed as we run like robotic simulators, for example. So that is one cool thing that happens in this uh, platform. The second interesting thing that it has a full interaction dynamics that is supported. That means it's no longer just about postural control or force control. You can actually interact with the system. For example, this ball or any physical devices. That means you can study the interaction of the body with the environment. And that enables the real response that is uh, that we want to study, we want to get feedback from, and we want to emulate in order to know the response and the feedback of the system and the environment together. And this will, go be, this will be incredibly interesting for rehab and assistive application studies, but in general, just musculoskeletal control as well. And as a result of these two key features, what we have is complex interaction dy dynamics, and the system also uh, supports a lot of the modern machine learning algorithms. So we can not just do postural control, but really drive the system forward. So for example, I'm showing you an em emulation over here of bowing balls, and I will show you much more tasks that has been solved for the first time in a physiologically realistic system. Okay. So let me pause here. I'll next go explain these models that exist, but maybe I can take a few questions if something wasn't clear about the positioning. Okay, so let's move forward. So the next, what I'm going to explain is what models are available in MyoSuite right now. Uh, towards the end, I'll also tell you guys about what new models we are working on. So the models are three well validated models are available. One is a Mayo finger, which is the, the one on the left. This is a simplified version of the model, which you will use as a unit test to get started, et cetera. The number second is the Mayo elbow. And this is a one joint six muscle uh, system, which is very well studied in the Myosim and, and biomechanics literature. So this is like one of the most classical things people try to use. So he, here is maybe for whom things are more familiar. Number B is where you will find your familiarity. And number C is basically where the whole system shows the full glory to you, that this is the entire hand model in 26 joints and 39 muscles. And we have validated it against the state-of-the-art open sim models. Plus we have found a lot of bugs, et cetera, that we, have uh, that, that we have fixed in the system. So at least I can say that it is as good as the state-of-the-art system. All right, so the question is like, how do we get to this state of the art system? So towards this end, what we did was we created an automatic pi pipeline to convert the OpenSIM model to the Majoko model or the MyoSuite models that we are talk talking about. So as a re result of this uh, conversation uh, co conversion, what will happen is we will find ourselves with identical geometry between the two models very close moment arm properties between the two models and very close muscle properties between the two models. So next I'm going to go into each one of these three phases uh, of the models uh, of the conversion and tell you guys about like what exactly happens in these th three phrases. So first is a conversion, then validation, then conversion two, then validation, and the conversion three and validation. So it's a three-step process. Let me just open these boxes one after the other. So the first step is the conversion one, where we convert mostly the geometric properties of the system. And this includes the body segment, joints, muscles, markers, etc. That means when you do validation against the forward kinematics between the OpenSim and Majoko models or MyoSuite models, we will probably see very similar behaviors. So if you maybe squeeze your eyes a little bit and uh, tally the blue and the orange, you will see them perfectly being aligned to each other. All right. So this is perfect conversion between OpenSim and MyoSuite right, right now. There is no loss of any properties in, in the phase one. In the phase two is where the wrapping optimization happens. That means the bones, all the muscles have to slide over the bone segments. They do not have a direct line of action between them. So this is where we optimize for all the wrapping objects, make sure none of the muscles are penetrating any of the bones, et cetera. And what we will see is if we see the the the, con the, the conversion step one model, there is a far bit of a gap between the conversion one and the original open sim model. But if you see the green and the blue, again, the green and the blue are perfectly symmetric to each other. That means even after the conversion step two, there is a perfect convergence between the open sim and the Majoko and or the Maya suite models. So this is where we have aligned the moment arm properties of the muscles and the bones. And the last step 
is where the force properties or this is where the dynamic properties of the muscles get aligned. So again, similar things. If you look at uh, the orange curve and the blue curve, there's a far bit of difference. And then after the optimization step, they are very close to each other. This is the worst case situation. And on the right is one of our normal, normal case situations that they are pretty much like indistinguishable from each other. Right after these three conversion step, what we have is physiologically realistic uh, models. These models are two orders of magnitude faster than the state of the art, and they have hybrid simulation of musculoskeletal and exoskeletal systems. So, for example, the elbow model that I've shown you before, uh, here the elbow model is combined with an exoskeleton. It's a little bit hard to visualize the rendering, but here is the arm socket. Here is the elbow joint and here is the, the forearm socket. So there is an exoskeleton on top of the whole muscles. And for this particular model, what I can tell you is if you start replicating this model over and over, you will see a linear increase in the average time it takes for myosuit to simul simulate it. And if we do that with OpenSim, there is an exponential blow up of the, uh, the properties. So that means that any model in OpenSim of similar complexity will take forever to simulate. And, and we are not even sure if we can do that properly at this point. So it, it, it's a system or a platform that scales very well with the numbers of system. And as a, as a result, we were able to build further biological phenomena on the whole platform that we have fatigue models where muscle fatigues over time. We have sarcopenia where the muscle forces actually decrease over time. We can simulate tendon tear, for example, very uh, good, uh, a common study, I don't know how common it is, but a well-known uh, proper study that happens is that if you act during an accident, it's very common for us to break some tendons of the thumb and it's a well-known surgery to move some of the tendons of the index finger towards the thumb so we can recover some of the movements of the thumb. And all of these properties are also available in MyoSuite. So now you can see how this is a very interesting system where we can study not only just interaction dynamics, but we can also simulate different biological phenomena to see what the effect of the control will be on these systems. That means, it, will this surgery be successful or not for a human? We can potentially simulate this before actually doing the surgery, which could have very interesting effect. I'm not going to claim that this is going to perfectly tell us what was going to happen after recovery, but at least this is a one validation that we can do before running some such surgeries. All right. Um, so by the way, feel free to stop me if I'm going too fast or if you have questions. Uh, because I cannot see any raised hand or anything like that. All right. So now that we I've explained to you what are the properties of the system, um, one of the claims I have made is now the system, because we have both contact dynamics as well as the speed of the system, we can embed these models in physiologically realistic tasks, which are much more complex than what we have been able to do so far in the community. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with something on the left that is better known in the community and towards the right bottom, I'll show you guys something new that I don't think we have seen so far in the community. So first we start with more common things, which is postural control. So for example, here it is just posing the joint angles, we have reaching behaviors using fingers that is also very well studied and known in the community. Straight in the bottom, we have the full hand postural control and full hand reaching properties. Uh, here we have elbow control, uh, where you have to like rotate the elbow to known degrees of freedom. And then finally, we have exoskeleton as well as musculoskeletal studies where we have both muscles as well as exoskeletons being controlled together. The rest of the four in the bottom right are where the contact dynamics kicks in. Here we have a full hand trying to rotate a key. So very well coordinated finger gating is required to solve these tasks. Here we have full reorientation task for an object where you have to reorient an object in different orientations and positions. Then the pen twirling experiments, I think with a lot of us twirl pens, I'm not sure like, Okay, if you do, I, I, if I'm sitting at a table, there are a bunch of pens I'm twirling while reading a paper or doing whatever. And finally, there is like a dual object manipulation task where while all the others were single object. And this is where we have to coordinate muscles as well as these objects, two objects together to share the workspace so that we can solve this powering ball, which is a rotation of these balls along the palms. 
All right, so here you can see basically some of these solutions of the task. I'm not going to show all the solutions, but these solutions are embedded in the Mayo uh, Suite framework where we have um, the, the normal machine learning algorithms. Here we have sh are showing you the on-policy algorithms a solution. What we see on the left is postural control. What is interesting to observe over here is like when the muscles are brighter is when they are more activated. So you can see their activations changing over time as we go through different postures. In the middle, we can see again, as you're trying to turn the key, different muscles are basically exchanging their antagonistic efforts on the system for finger gating and moving the, 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 uh, the key along. And on the far right, you will see the contact dynamics in full contact dynamics and display where we are trying to position the pen in one of the goal locations that is marked on the right. Again, like you can sort of follow how the muscle dynamics changes over time as we are trying to make these small maneuvers. So, I mean, Vikash, I mean, some of these maneuvers, right? I mean, you have also shown in some other prior works that you were able to do, right? So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, do you notice a big difference in, you know, behaviors when you do it with a more realistic hand versus an unrealistic hand, maybe in terms of the torques which are applied or, you know, something else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is a question that I have gotten every time I've, I've talked about this. And essentially, there are a fair bit of differences between them. One of them is the, these are antagonistic muscle pairs, right? In a normal robotic hand, you have direct transmission on the joint. That means the same joint, you can apply a positive torque and the negative torque, and they, they don't fight with each other. Over here, you don't have this one-to-one -one system, is, which is like one actuator for one joint. It is a many-to-many -many system where one single muscle will have a moment of on many different joints. And the other way around is since the joints are coupled, if you try to move one of the joints, it will have an effect on other joints as well. So the many-to-many -many relationship, as well as the antagonistic relationship between two muscles can simultaneously pull and have something that we call co-contraction, they induce a fair bit of complexity in the actuation dynamics of the system in musculoskeletal control. So what we will see is initially, as you try to learn, most of the time, the muscles will try to fight with each other and they will try to co-activate and both of them will try to waste a lot of energy fighting against each other. And, and slowly, as you before you start learning the task behaviors, you will start seeing the co-contraction of the system go down. So it, it first learns that like we have to stop fighting. There is one side of the muscle, which is for contraction and the other side of the muscle is for expansion. And these kind of behaviors slowly kind of emerge. So one is basically co-contraction going down. The second effect that happens is energy of the system being more preserved rather than like, ex like exhausted while doing just more babbling kind of a movement. And then eventually the task control kicks in. Right. So some of the transfers that I've seen from like more robotic settings to here is like some of the, the models, for example, task definitions, I think transfer quite well, the reward functions, et cetera. I think a lot of the intuitions I've built over like the robotic system transferred quite well. But then when it was about regularizing the actual body and like how do we uh, formulate the whole MDP around a muscle segment, I think those things required more work. I see. So, and, and and maybe a follow-up, but this might be, you know, for later in the talk, you know, I'm just, so, so I guess it's very clear how, you know, building these systems, you know, might be of help to neuroscience in some ways on help if we are building prosthetics or exoskeletons. Mm -hmm. But I guess if we ask the reverse question, right, I mean, to the machine learning community, you know, what does this challenge, you know, gets us? Right? Is it saying that because this is a high dimensional system, the exploration is much harder, and, you know, that is where innovation is needed or is there some other messaging also? I think I would not be able to give you concrete messaging today, but we are definitely like, I'm, I'm saying like, I, I'm here to okay. learn from the rest of the community, but I can give you some of the thoughts that I have so far, right? This is not, no, by no means a, a conclusion of any kind, but like maybe more open questions. So one of the things which we as a machine learning community have struggled with is finding relevant high dimensional tasks 
that have impact, immediate impact in the community today, right? We always keep doing this toy problems, half cheetah, like, you know, different kind of settings, even for robotics. Like it, it's the promise of the future, but not today, right? So okay. here it is a very well positioned set of tasks where if we give any concrete evidence of, you know, we are doing anything useful, I think it will find immediate impact in the community, right? That That is a very well positioned and very well motivated punchline for me, even if we don't learn anything new. But like you said, there is lots of technical questions over here, which is like, you know, uh, like high dimensional system, third order dynamics, like we have never seen any third order dynamical system right now in machine learning benchmarks. So third order, order dynamics, how do we control such complex system? Plus how does human has this complex decision making, which is not just a real time synthesis of behavior. Like we have memory, right? We have long-term memory, we have short-term memory. So it's a distributed control that we as a whole organisms do. And these kind of questions haven't exposed themselves quite yet in the ML side of literature. So I think I'm more interested about the potential. I don't think I've, I have anything to like actually say concretely rather than I'll just say that I'm pretty excited about the potential it presents. Okay, okay, great, great. All right, any more questions? All right, let's move forward. All right, so I think like this is where um, I start going a little bit towards the machine learning side of things. And and let's see, I, I see a chat. I'm not sure if anyone, okay, I think someone else, okay. All right, so now the question is that like, now we have this system, which is very reliable. Um, we can simulate them very well. We can pos position them in complex, realistic, contact-rich tasks. And my background is in like dexterous manipulation. So I'm always coming down into this land of saying like, okay, expressive behaviors, let's just narrow it down to manipulation and see, can we solve this manipulation? So if we look today, how we have tried to solve manipulation, you'll find a few benchmarks where it's goal condition to be begin with. Like if you tell me where is the goal of the, the object, then you just try to take the object to the goal, right? And the, the, the task is actually synthesized in a very curated manner that there is some very good initialization that is very good dense reward functions, et cetera, that is written. So for me right now, the existing manipulation behaviors that we synthesize are quite narrow and they don't generalize. So one of the questions I start asking was like, what is the way to generalize man manipulation behavior the way humans do manipulation, right? And I want to come up with like a form problem statement or formulation that will give me any manipulation behavior possible and I should be able to synthesize it. So let me first give you what I've come up with and I'll try to tell you why this is better or worse than the, the, the existing ones so far, all right? So the manipulation behavior that I'm going to describe is like this, that I'm going to be interested in any object that is like you can th think of these three objects and a trajectory that the object should follow both in position and orientation space. Okay, and this trajectory can come from anywhere. You can think of like motion captures of objects or any experts or humans doing these object movements or like some kind of animation. You just wanted like this can to follow some sinusoid behavior, let's say. So the, uh, the behaviors, the manipulation behaviors we are looking for is any behavior that this object can take. That, that's all it is. Okay, then I can position it with any hand right now. There is no Mayo hand in the system, but like think of, this as any hand in the system that I can put it in. And from these two combinations, I want this hand to be able to enable this object trajectory. And if, if, if it can enable this object trajectory, then I can say that this hand actually position uh, has dexterous manipulation capability. Okay, does that seem narrow? Does it seem wide? I'm open to criticism on this. This, this is like kind of a formulation that I've claimed up to be a bit better. Right, And the reason I'm saying that this is a bit better is now the source of these trajectories could be anything, right? I put no constraint on them. This hand could be anything. I put no constraint on them. And if there is a formulation that can give me a dexterous manipulation behavior, then I can claim that the whole system is very capable in general. 
right? The, the reason this is more powerful than the traditional goal condition formulation that we have seen is I can keep this trajectory to be constant at the goal trajectory and I can recover the goal condition formulation. Right? So if the goal is some state vector S, S, S star, you can just think of like S star being the whole trajectory, and then you recover the goal condition formulation. Uh, but this formulation, what it allows is it allows us to even specify repetitive movement, because if you're trying to just, let's say, hammer, and the hammering is like going back and forth, back and forth, I want that exact maneuver, right? And there's no way for me to specify that as a goal condition behavior. The second thing which this doesn't allow me to do is force behaviors. If, if the whole task is like, hey, press this as hard as possible on a wall, this formulation will not allow that. So there are some benefits and some drawback of this formulation, but stick with me. If you have questions, I can take it, but, but let's, let's open this formulation for debate later. Okay, so now what I've done is I've taken this grab data set, I think some of you might be familiar with, that there is a grab data set where humans were asked to perform manipulation behavior on a large repertoire of, of objects. And what you see over here is these large repertoire of objects and, and human uh, uh, recovered from these human recordings. But only object trajectories have been recovered, no hand data is available. Right? And my claim is that I will be, try to solve manipulation for all of these behave, all of these object trajectories that I've seen over there. Okay, so this I've formulated all of this in a standard OpenAI gym formulation and solved using standard reinforcement learning techniques. So I've, I'm not going to tell you any cool new algorithms over here. I'm just going to say that like how this formulation has changed everything, uh, and it can enable. So what it is is here is the action space of the whole hand. So what I'm after is I'm trying to recover a policy pi that takes following things as an input, hand positions and velocities, pretty standard. The muscle activations, so this is the internal state of the muscle, muscle activation. The object current pose and velocity, so the current state of the system, and this is the object trajectory. So this is the object goal trajectory from zero to T that I was interested in. So I positioned like, so instead of just doing goal condition, I did it, condition it on the entire trajectory. And the last is the basically key thing here. So what I have given was one extra system, which is a very well-known technique. I think it goes back decades that there is a pre-grasp that is specified for that particular object for this particular hand. And you can think of this as an affordance model there is some kind of affordance model that tells me for this particular object, what pre-grasp the hand will pick. So in my earlier formulation, this pre-grasp basically is that affordance model. So for this particular object, that's my output of the affordance model. And given this, this output, everything that I'm going to tell you after is standard. I'm not going to change anything in the system. So there's a reward function, which is a standard reward function, which basically says object error, uh, in position and quaternion space, plus some uh, bonus for lifting the object. And that's pretty much it. And, and some regularization for using less energy. And I'm going to freeze this system at these two formulations. And then I'm going to run standard RL algorithms after this. Okay. And this basically is the single frame, which is getting as an extra supervision. Beyond this, this is a standard RL formulation. Nothing has changed. And this single frame supervision is coming from some sort of an affordance model right now. Okay. And after this, what I'm going to claim is the results are interesting manipulation behavior across all set of objects that I was showing you bef before. Here is trying to watch a clock, what time it is, right? There's different iterations of that. You can try to analyze the naturalness of the movement. Um, there is definitely a lot of natural behaviors. There is definitely a lot of not natural behaviors as well, but those are quite rare. So here is drinking um, a coffee over here. Right here is oh, my internet seems slow. All right, so here's a shaking a water bottle. Here's the cyclic behaviors that couldn't be specified in the goal condition formulation, right? Um, well, let's go next. 
All right, so here is basically the same object, two different trajectories were specified as the goal trajectories. And there were two different pregrass that were outputted because the affordances for these two are different. One is drinking, another one is pouring. Okay, and the video sort of continues on and on over from here. But then what I said was a standard RL algorithm, just formulation is different over here. And based on the formulation difference, everything changes. Now we can synthesize a large repertoire of manipulation behavior just because of that pregrass affordance model. And here is an interesting uh, ablation that I'm going to show. On the top is basically our performance right now. So it's pretty on par with everything that you see below. And these are most of the state of the art algorithms. Some is called graph. There's some kind of a curriculum where you start from slow, like simpler tasks and go to harder tasks. And we also have deep mimic as a baseline. So it's very competitive to all of these baselines, but it uses none of the you know, Oracle information from these baselines, right? Which is pretty incredible. No curriculum you have to synthesize, no full trajectory, full hand trajectory you have to specify for deep mimic. But what is even stark is if you just remove the affordance model of this pre-grasp information from all of these baselines, their performance dropped drastically to the point that they are no longer effective at all. So it almost tells us that most of what we saw in these algorithms was work done by this pre-grasp affordance model. And there's a little, only a little bit of addition for most of what they say, right? So at the end, what we have is this interesting framework, I, I wouldn't even call it algorithm, that does most of what you do from this one frame, which is a pre-grasp frame, which can call affordance model, and vision literature has been pretty good at synthesizing this affordance model right now. So this simplifies a lot of how we think of dexterous manipulation today, and we can do a lot. Okay, so before I move forward, I, I said a lot of things. Maybe just pause here and, and, and wait if, if, if everything landed or if, if there are questions. Hi, can I ask a couple of questions? Absolutely, go for it. Uh, wait, I'll turn on for the camera on so you have uh, someone to talk with. Uh, hi, Vikash, nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you. I'm a postdoc here at MIT. I work in uh, human model control. And I think it's really interesting what you're doing and what you're presenting today. Uh, thanks so much. And uh, I've been actually looking into reinforcement learning for human model control my, myself. And uh, I've been wondering, for instance, like this pre-grasp really resonates with what humans do. We have internal models for yeah. predicting how to interact with objects. And this is something that is quite well established in the in human model control. So I was wondering if you can tell us more about this pre-grasping and how this affordance model works and how do you build this pre-grasp configurations? Okay, yes. So I can, again, I, I, I want to reiterate, nothing I've told here today is something that is new is just positioned in a better framework. I said pre-grasp has been studied in robotics, in, in biomechanics, in neuroscience for a while. So I'm not claiming anything new about the pre-grasp. I'm just trying to position all those concepts that are well known in a reinforcement learning formulation that makes things very, very easy, right? So the pre-grasp here, which we know traditionally is basically this last particular term. It essentially, it's the, the way we have defined this is what is the approach configuration of the hand just before any contact with the object, right? That, that's how it is defined. And reason I've gone with pre-grasp rather than grasp it because it relaxes a lot of assumptions about. Because if you have a, if you need a grasp, you need to know about the forces, you need to know about the geometry. So you need a lot more information from the object as well as the, the contact sensors. But if you want to just go for the pre-grasp, it's just an open free space movement. It's a very easy to do that. And it has no bearing on surface properties of the object. It just needs to know a rough shape of the object, right? So the obvious question comes, where does this pre-grasp come from, right? Um, so I would start with like ridiculous sounding ones and then maybe go for like a little bit smarter ones. So ridiculous ones, like it's one frame, like just, you know, even if you have five sliders, a bunch of sliders to move, you can move those sliders, number one easy to specify. And in our benchmarks, we have a combination of ways we can bring pre-grasp to show that it doesn't matter what the source of the pre-grasp is. It's just like you get it somehow, all right? So use sliders, pretty dumb. 
works. Um, you know, run any of this hand tracking algorithms that you can find online works on one camera, just position your hand, give it that, it works. Okay. The third is if you have motion capture, which is very common in, in biomechanics, all right? Grab data set has motion capture. You can just extract that one frame that you are interested in, and that could be a source of the pre-grasp. But the more interesting ones are that in, in this is mostly coming from the vision uh, community, that given a video, they can predict the hand position that will grasp the video or pre-grasp the video very well. So we take those models and we just relax it open a little bit so that we don't get into these weird um, you know, collisions and stuff. So we have played around with all these different kinds of pre-grasp positions. It works quite well with all of them. So I, I would say agnostic to the source of pre-grasp, just figure it out any way you can find this affordance model. And once you have this affordance model, plug in this formulation and any standard auto algorithm is able to solve it. Perfect. Thank, thanks so much. And another, another last curiosity, then I will leave others to ask questions. The reward function, I mean, the structure is pretty common for, for enforcement learning, but it's always like the question of how you crank these reward functions in reinforcement learning can really affect the result. So yeah. I was wondering if you can also comment a bit on this. Yeah, you just use the one we gave. And don't, don't worry about it. It is the exact, they have, have changed nothing in the reward function action, nothing, all of these like exact same formulation without any hyperparameter tuning and it works across everything, right? That That is what I'm trying to tell you guys that usually it is very narrow the way we have defined manipulation tasks. It's always reward function tuning. It's always like find this, find that. Here is one formulation. And I'm telling you what is the input and output of the system. You don't even have to touch the formulation inside. Okay. No hyperparameter tuning is done between all of these behaviors. All right. And now where we started was like, you know, postural controls with you know physiologically correct models. That's where the community is. And the 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 where we stand today is not that we have contact rich manipulation with the system, but I'm showing you generalizable manipulation behavior with physiologically realistic system. So I would like to believe that we have pushed the needle quite a bit. We are still working to, to get better and better, but I think this is in stark contrast with where the community was today. Uh, and I, that's why I think like the my suite the, as a whole framework is very, very interesting. And that's why I want to engage more and more with the community to learn like, you know, where are the gaps? What, what else can we bridge over here? Perfect. Thanks so much. Absolutely. All right. So I'll leave this set of questions for later in the interest of time and let's move forward. Um, so where are we going after this? Um, we are definitely interested in moving forward. Right now, I just showed you like maybe the hand and the forearm system. We are working on full arm system, bimanual systems, full body systems. Uh, we are looking into validation studies to uh, go beyond what OpenSimCal tells today because we have definitely made fixes and improvements on top. But unless we validate, it's a little bit hard to convince like if, if our fixes are better or for worse. So I think we are looking into some of the validation studies, task complexities. We are looking into further and further boosting the task complexity. I showed you like this 40 different tasks from Grab that we have created. We are kind of like moving forward just beyond dexterous manipulation, going into lower limb segments, like gait behaviors, et cetera. And we are also interested in looking into like robotics and rehab communities that can we transfer some of these, these uh, you know, lessons we have learned so far into much more realistic system. So at the end, what I think how this whole thing comes together is, you know, in machine learning community, we started on top left. There is a lot of like cool reinforcement learning literature that are solving things in like ideological simulations and robotic simulations. Whereas the open sim was a little bit lagging behind and we have this myo suite system that brings it on par with these simulations that we have seen so far, right? Um, but these simulations so far are still far from being realistic so that we can actually do them in the real world because there, are a lot, there is a big reliance that is, comes from sensing and tactile sensors, et cetera, that we are still going to miss in, in any of like the actual 
a real world system. So there is some work going on. I think like a lot of you will be more familiar than I am in like, you know, tactile sensing or like more physiologically correct biometric hands. So if we can bring some of these technologies together in comparison with what robotic systems can do today, and I feel like, you know, rehab devices, there are, there are quite a lot of rehab devices that are approaching the complexity and capability of the robotic systems plus the reliability i think there is a path that i can see that can lead us closer and closer to human level dexterity and and more generally the human level decision making in terms of much more skeletal or more more skeletal control all right so i think like we have taken the same lessons we have i i told you today and i've applied to, to a robotic system as well here is a shadow hand i think the lessons are quite similar there are a few failure cases i think it comes up in in the top right here is the piggy bank i think the the weight of the system is so high that the the hand cannot handle it beyond things like that the system seems fairly um capable right uh and i want to go into Meyer challenge, which is the existing NeurIPS challenge that we are running. Uh, I would need around five minutes to explain that. But like before I go there, let me just pause and see. I can take um, a quick couple of questions on the, the existing part of the talk. All right. In that case, let's move forward. So I showed you some of the things we have achieved so far, but definitely not all the way. And this is where I think, you know, developing things in isolation is never a good idea. And especially when I'm not in the community of like biomechanics or neuroscience. So wanted to engage with the community. So the best uh, advice I got from the senior, senior, senior advisors are, hey, run a challenge and ask the community to come in and tell you how things are wrong or come join hands and build it together. So this is what we are running uh, right now. It's live. It's called Myo Challenge. It's a New Rips 2022 competition track. And there are two tracks running on it. One is single uh, object manipulation, which is the die rotation. You have to reorient the die closer to the goal that is specified. And there is a dual object manipulation, which is the bowing balls. And both the physical properties of these systems will be changing over time. So we will have to find like more generalization to different perturbations and environment conditions uh, during, as a part of the challenge. So what is the challenge all about? Let me just go briefly over it. This is the MyoSuite platform that you see. You can, like right now, we have the hand models, lower models, and the full body models are coming. The goal of the simulation is to learn physiological dexterity. There's a Myo hand, which is 23 degree of uh, uh, joints, 39 muscles. There is sensing, which is the hand and object sensing available. And in the Mayo challenge, we are trying to make the hand do two things. One is single object track, which is the diary orientation to the goal location. The double object track is bowing balls. There are efforts as well as successes that you have access to. And then we give a lot of practice tasks, tutorials, and collabs and baselines for us to reproduce all of these things so we can get started on that early on. It's launched running. It ends October 28th, still a month and a half left in the challenge. So please participate. We have lots of compute credits to give out. Uh, so if you want compute credits to participate, please give me a ping. I would be happy to give you guys compute credits to participate. Um, feel free to note down the website. It will also be available easily if you can Google or towards the end of the talk as well. Right. And uh, at the end, I think we have been communicated that, um, yeah, the challenge will be uh, the challenge will run during the NeurIPS competition. It will actually be in person. There will be talks and in, uh, invited talks on the challenge winners. So I think it's pretty exciting. Right now, we already, I think we are roughly a month in and we see about, you know, 30 serious teams participating and it's it's getting hot and really, really interesting. So yeah, if if this is something close to what you actually work, I would be happy to hear from you or talk more about the challenge and introduce you to how, how we can get started. There's a lot of like getting started in tutorials. Uh, so I think you're in good, good shape uh, to begin with. All right, with that, that will be the end of the talk and I'll take any questions. Meanwhile, I'll flash the set of questions, which I think are also very, very cool in the two different communities. All right, happy to take any questions. Great, well, let's thank Vikash for this wonderful talk. I think Vikash, it's exciting. And yeah, let's see if there are any questions from anyone.
I think everyone is just in a state of awe, Vikash, you know. <laughs> nothing, nothing landed, Pulkit. Don't try to cover it. <laughs> uh, great, great. So what's, what's, can, can you make a bet, Vikash? And do you think this task will be solved?